think we should have a populist movement against technicians of the <laughs> okay uh, good afternoon everybody and good morning I think to the people who are joining us from the UK and other places uh, it's my pleasure today uh, to introduce Professor Paul Taggart from the University of Sussex. Uh, he's well known for his uh, interesting writings on populism. He's a professor of politics there in Sussex. And uh, he is focused on comparative politics and research. Uh, his research mainly focuses on populism, which uh, is clear from his many, I think, uh, uh, publications which I think a lot of you would probably have seen them. Uh, <coughs> there is uh, uh, his 19, 1996 book, uh, New Politics and the New Populism, uh, from Palgrave, and then uh, his Populism from McGraw Hill uh, in 2000, and he had a contribution uh, in the uh, uh, Oxford Handbook of Populism, and I also saw a chapter of his at, uh, in a book called the Populism and the Pathology, I think. Uh, uh, the topic uh, which uh, he discussed today uh, is an interesting one. What do populist leaders do when they become the establishment? Uh, I would guess that they will probably be against themselves. <laughs> so, but I will uh, uh, leave it to Professor Paul Tegart to explain to us. Please, go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. I'm sorry I'm not there. I genuinely am sorry I'm not there because it's minus two degrees here. <laughs> and however, however cold you feel your air conditioning or the 20 degrees you have, I'd rather be where you are than I, where I am. But there you go. Um, so it's, it's great, and I'm very honoured to be to be asked to, to talk at your your fantastic winter school. It's a fantastic lineup, and congratulations on getting uh, such a great lineup. Uh, I'm going to in a minute. I'll I'll share my screen, and um, but I'll give, for a moment, I'll just say something before I start, which is to say, um, I'm going to give you a talk, which is I hope you'll forgive me. I'm giving you a talk which I'm still thinking about. Um, I'm still thinking about as I'm giving it, um, and. Uh, uh, perhaps we'll think about when I finish. So it's not a completed piece of work. It's something that I'm very interested to get feedback. And I really admire the Winter School in bringing together so many people from so many different contexts. And I would really welcome comments that relate to um, perhaps people drawing on the, the, the backgrounds that they have to, to comment on what I'm going to say, because I'm trying to give you an overall schema for uh, suggesting how we, we, we can understand populists in power. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. And um, I've entitled the, the, the lecture Foxes in the Chicken Coop. And the reason for that is trying to <clears throat> emphasize the point that populists uh, run against the establishment. What do they do? Uh, uh, when they become part of the establishment, and it provides a challenge for them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do everything that I tell my students not to do. I'm going to draw on a whole series of different cases and examples to illustrate my point. I'm not systematically going to work through a couple of cases like Daniel did yesterday uh, very effectively. I'm going to be very, very broad and, and, and try and make some generalizations. Um, and I'm going to ask you to, to bear with me to, as, I, as I move through those, but these are meant to be illustrative. I'm trying to think broadly about what populism does in power. The understanding of populism obviously at the moment faces two interesting things, I think. First of all, the, what we can see is this global wave of populism, or the wave of populism uh, both growing as insurgent forces and government forces around the world. Um, with some notable examples, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. So we have a, a kind of a, a high point of populism. Obviously, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has provided a challenge for, for all governments and for populists elsewhere. Um, but 
notwithstanding that, we have now a huge range of populism. There's not populism everywhere, and I think we you need to be careful about that, but we have enough um, cases of populism to really look at what's going on generally. We have a, a great variety. But I would warn against what I call, well, I'm talking about Sartori, I suppose, here, about conceptual overstretch. And in this world where, if you've travelled recently, you will have been subject to extensive COVID testing, um, I think we should avoid, we should minimise any false positives. And I think there's a lot of false positives about populism. In other words, populism is used much too widely, and I think often, very often used inaccurately to describe politicians who are not populists. Um, now, the point here is that populism is a thin-centred ideology. It draws on ideologies that can't survive on its own. So it's always mixed up with other concepts. Um, authoritarianism, perhaps in some cases, um, um, nativism, other parts of it are, are related to it, but they aren't the same thing as it. And I, wanted to, I, want, I think we should be quite careful about what, when we are talking about populism and when we're talking about its associated concepts. So I put my cards on the table. I think that, you know, we, we, there are a lot of examples of what people call populists who aren't populists. I don't think Boris Johnson is a populist. I don't think Bernie Sanders is a populist. I think a lot of the cases, and it's very easy to use those, t those terms very loosely to describe people as populists, but they're not. We have enough cases. We don't need to, to add to cases that aren't populists um, to add to the set of cases we can look at. The second thing I think we, I, would, I would kind of urge us to do is to try and think objectively um, about the phenomenon of populism. Of course populism is by definition hostile to us. By us I mean universities and, and, and scholars and researchers. By definition populism is about gut instinct, it's about, about core responses, it doesn't like intellectuals, it doesn't like, well it doesn't like the sort of people we are. And I've been, to, I've been studying populism for a very long time, um, before it was cool, and uh, I've never yet been to a populist conference where there's been a populist attending or, or um, there. There have been some, but they're very rare because essentially populism is hostile to, it, to the study of it. Now that, that therefore puts us in an antagonistic position towards populism. But I think we need to, we, we can recognize that, but we need to be objective. We need to stand back and say, well, whether we like it or not, or whether it likes us or not, I think we need to uh, try and analyse it objectively. And that's something that I'm trying to do. Whether I like it or not, um, what does it do and how does it do it? And sometimes what does it not do uh, is important. So those are my two pleas. One, to avoid false positives and to try and be objective about it. The second thing we can note about the populist wave or the contemporary context is with more cases of populism, but it's become, um, we've got many more examples of populists who are in power. And that's clearly what, what I'm focusing on today. In my early work on populism, it was very much about populism in Europe as, a, um, as an insurgent force, as a challenge to the establishment, and usually sitting at the, the edges of the, the political system, challenging the, the mainstream. But clearly that, that's no longer the case in, in Europe exclusively. It is the case, but it's not only the case that populists have, have come to power. Um, we have, and Donald Trump being obviously the, the kind of the classic case of uh, the most prominent case of a populist in power, but many others which I'll talk about in a moment. But there's nothing new about populism in power. Populism has been in government many times before, whether we're talking about um, Juan Perón in, in, in Argentina, whether we're talking about Huey Long in Louisiana. Populists have been in power. It's not, it's not, it's not a, a, an entirely novel phenomenon. But again, that gives us... Uh, um, a set of cases uh, increases the, the, the comparative reach for us to allow to, to think really about what populism does in power. We have more cases now, uh, and the ones I'm going to focus on are mainly contemporary cases. And there is an emerging literature on populists in government. I'm interested to see that, that um, people who don't, who write about, for instance, public administration and public policy are starting to turn their attention to populism. Indeed, I would venture to suggest that most people who study anything have turned their, their attention to populism in the past few years. It's been something that many people have focused on, which is great. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very welcoming of those people who want to study it. But it means we have a, a whole set of scholarship now that allows us to move on. So that's the context. What the setup of the question is, is a very simple one, which is I think that 
being in power, being successful, getting, getting elected to office, um, provides a challenge to, to populists. Um, and I think that there are three ways of, of thinking of that challenge. The first is the obvious one I've mentioned in the introduction, which is that populism comes to power through opposition to the establishment or to the, or being anti-elite and often opposed to the functioning of mainstream politics. So once it's in government, how does it then situate itself? How does it, once it becomes part of the establishment, how does it maintain its anti-establishment credentials or how does it sustain itself in power? That is a, prob a problematic. Those people that elected it to office uh, were expected to be anti-establishment, but how do, you be, how do you maintain those credentials once in office? So that's one of the core aspects of, of populism, one of the definitions of it is, is, is opposed to an establishment. So once it's in power, how does it, um, how does it reconcile that, um, that basis of, of appeal with what it's going to do? We can also see that, that populists um, are associated often as or with outsiders. In the broader sense, populism claims to be for those outside of politics, those who have been excluded. They may be the, they may be the majority, but the, the argument for populism is that the majority has been ignored. Very often, we have populists who are non-politicians who uh, become politicians. Donald Trump had no elected experience of anything before becoming president of the United States. Um, which is an astonishing fact if you, if you think about it. But it's very common and that populist leaders have often been, for instance, businessmen, uh, businessmen and women, sorry, I shouldn't be gendered on that, but people like Perot and, um, and Babis and so on, people and um, Berlusconi, and they come into politics claiming that their expertise for being outside of politics, for being an outsider, is actually what makes them good uh, uh, politicians. It will, it will break with the norms of politics. In effect, those outsiders, if they, if they are outsiders, of course, they become insiders, they become, they become politicians. But very often, you still see them trying to frame themselves as being outside of normal politics. Silvio Berlusconi, when he was in power, very much portrayed himself still as a victim, um, being attacked by the judiciary, being, being attacked um, by the establishment. Um, so that it's even in power as the ultimate insider, the ultimate part of the establishment, part of their credibility becomes uh, for being an outsider. So that's another way of, of, that provides another dilemma. If you're an outsider, how do you work with the institutions of, of government? The third reason that I think that, that populists have a problem with, with power is because what I call their unpolitics. And my claim here um, is that, that a key part of populism is that it appeals to uh, a, a claim of un being unpolitical, of unpolitics. And what I mean by that is that populism, often um, as a, uh, if you like, a narrative, sets it up um, to be appealing to people who don't normally function within politics. It, does, it appeals to the people that don't really like politics, in a sense. The idea, and the, this goes back to the idea of the, the say, uh, the business leader coming into politics. I will come into to, to biz, I'll come into politics. I'll get elected as a populist to try and make things function in a different way, and then I'll get out of it. I'll go back. I'll go back out of politics. It's seen as a dirty business. And if you want to understand how populism um, appeals to unpolitics, I think you just, the best thing you can do is not to read any books, but to look at the, the film Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, that classic Frank Capra movie about uh, uh, US politics and a populist politician, a Cub Scout leader thrown into politics. But the clear thing is that politics is viewed as a very negative activity. And politics is viewed as a corrupting activity. And then Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, he arrives in the Senate, finds it's corrupt, and it's an American film, so it all ends happily. But it shows that, that what he's doing is entering the dark world of politics. For populists, the core appeal is to people who don't really like politics. And I think that's one of the things that we misunderstand about, about populism. So my last claim on this is that populism is not simply an opposition to an establishment and a claim to speak for the people. 
it also has a particular relationship to politics. This is very important for me, that to claim that populism is merely anti-establishment, pro-people politics, um, is to give a false positive. Because communism, fascism, both of those fit that category, but they're not populist. So populism has to have a particular view of politics, which I think relates to its, its appeal to unpolitics. So again, being unpolitical creates a challenge for being in power, for being in office. Now, a while ago, I think it was 21 years ago, I said that populism has a problem with power. And uh, there have been books that have written been written since then saying well it doesn't have a problem with being in power it can sustain itself in power and i think that's true i think that populism to say it has a, a challenge of being in power is not to say it necessarily fails but what i'm going to argue now is that it is constrained into what into the way it can operate once in in office and that may have a challenge for its long-term stability it doesn't necessarily mean that populism fails in the, and the book, for instance, is a book by Albert Tazzy and MacDonald, which, which looks very, an excellent book called Populism and Power, which looks at, at populists in, in three European states, and populists in power, and shows that they can sustain themselves in power, and they can sustain support. They don't necessarily become, become failures in office, because you might assume once you become part of the establishment, you lose your anti-establishment credentials and, and you lose support, but they show that's not the case. And I don't think that, that, that I think that's, that's, that's very true. But I still think there are challenges that populists can't always operate in the same way that other elected politicians can operate. So when I say it's a challenge, I'm not saying it's necessarily going to cause them to collapse, although I do have questions about the long-term stability of populism. But, that, but you can have a populist regime for a period of time. But it is to say that they are constrained into what they can do. And all I want to do now is just suggest three ways that I think the populists tend to resolve this dilemma. The first strategy is the simplest one, which is many populists, once in office, simply moderate their populism. For some, it might mean fully abandoning it. For some, it might mean just toning it down but the obvious this is an obvious response to once being in office the constraints of office being part of the establishment how do you sustain yourself and i've distinguished three there may be more but three different ways of thinking or examples of how they've, they've moderated their, their populism the most extreme example and this is taken from um some latin american scholarship looking at um uh, what's called the bait and switch strategy and this is the argument that populism will uh, um, run an election campaign on a certain basis on a populist basis getting support from the poor redistribution changing the system but once in office will in a machiavellian sort of a way switch to what it's doing and actually abandon those commitments that's the extreme form that's fully abandoning populism and the example of extreme cases are, are color in, in brazil fujimori in peru and menem in argentina uh, who as far as i can see it, uh, ran for office claiming to be speaking for the poor claiming to uh, have redistributive policies um, at a time of crisis, but once in office, they all, in their own different ways, shifted to quite neoliberal agendas of privatization and austerity and uh, pursued a policy agenda that looked very much at odds with the sorts of um, uh, campaign promises they make. Now, that's quite rare, if I'm honest with you, that we don't see that very often. Um, but that's one example or one, top, one, one way of resolving that dilemma. Essentially, you abandon your populism in this case. Um, you become a, a, a fundamentally different stripe. More common um, are the other ones. And the first one I've called policy creep, um, or perhaps you might want to think about it as ideological creep. And I always think about this in terms of, of Silvio Berlusconi, who in running for office originally was trying to change the system, 
who ran in different ways. He had uh, uh, Forza Italia was forms a different sort of organization. And he, he, he said, I'm against the establishment. I'm, uh, I want to run against those, um, uh, the mainstream um, forces in, in Italy. But in practice, over time, and Berlusconi was in, in power for a long time, he's even still trying to become president, I gather. But over time, Berlusconi, I think, lost his populism and, and can be described ideologically by the time, by, certainly by his last administration, as, a, as almost conventional Christian democratic politician, um, part of the centre-right uh, in the European uh, parties of families. Um, and so, in a sense, ideologically, he moved, he moved from, from the unconventional to the conventional. He may have had many other unconventional aspects to his regime or his lifestyle, uh, but politically, by the end of his regime, and quite early on, I think he looked more like a conventional Christian Democrat uh, than a true populist. And that's very common. And so Berlusconi is only one example of that, but I'm sure that you can think of other cases of politicians that have, have, have shifted what they stand for and have moved particularly into the mainstream. And that's what, you know, uh, that's, that for, for uh, a populist is, is highly problematic. The other case that springs to mind is, is um, a third, the third example comes from the case, which is thinking about Syriza in Greece, the, the party of the left that came into power at the time of the Euro crisis, promising radical reform, promising to not in, in engage in austerity, to, to not implement the, uh, the, the terrible haircut that was being uh, imposed on them by European institutions, but in the end, ended up doing that. They've, so Syriza, as a radical leftist populist force, came into office and was fundamentally constrained by the circumstances. It's pretty difficult for them not to do that, I would suggest. And that's why they had divisions within the party. Um, but that's different from, from the choice of Berlusconi, where Berlusconi essentially ideologically is kind of moving in a certain direction. Whereas I, argue that, I would argue that the left populist forces like Syriza were forced by, by circumstances to abandon the agenda that they had, and they've now become back to being kind of a left populist party. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is there are different ways of moderating your populism. You can fully abandon it, you can ideologically change, or you can say, well, circumstances are forcing us to do different things. And you might well expect that that last, that last one is obviously particularly relevant to the contemporary examples of, of populists facing the, the pandemic. There's a classic example uh, something that Daniel talked about yesterday in his lecture about how they respond to a crisis um, and force them to, to uh, behave in ways that perhaps they wouldn't have, have advocated before they were elected. The second choice for populists, it seems to me, is some form of institutional engineering. So say they choose not to moderate their populism. Um, what they can do, and they, what they have done in many cases, is to try and change the institutions of politics. This has two key important benefits for the, the populace. First of all, it fulfills their opposition to the establishment agenda. In other words, simply trying to change the institutions is living up to what they promised. We want to change politics. We don't want politics as normal. We want to alter politics. So it's a symbolic validation of the populist credentials of being anti-establishment if it's trying to change the institutions of the establishment. The second reason that, that uh, it's useful for, for populists is that opposing the establishment um, uh, uh, also uh, re-engineering it often is done with the specific objective to try and minimize the power of their, their enemies. So it's a way of trying to limit opposition to them. So there are good reasons why populists um, can choose to engineer institutions when they get into power. And again, I've tried to think about different ways they might do the different forms of institutional engineering. Um, and at the extreme end, uh, there's the case of, of constitutional reform. You have populists gaining power who say, right, um, I'm actually going to rewrite the constitution. And you see that with Chavez in, in Venezuela, you see it with Correa in Ecuador, 
And you've also seen it with Erdogan uh, after the coup attempt in, in Turkey. So they're actually saying, well, we're going to, we're literally going to physically, well, not physically, but, but uh, change the constitutional makeup. They may do it for referendum. They may, they may, and in case of Chavez and Korea, it's about reconstituting legislature, often in ways that, of course, as you expect, will benefit them. But they rewrite the constitution. That's rarer, but, but it, it does happen. And there are some cases where we can think about later, perhaps in the discussion, where people haven't changed the constitution, but maybe changed the nature of the institutions generally. I think, I think India's a really interesting case that I'd like to think about more in regard to that. The second strategy, if you can't change the constitution, um, I've talked about defanging hostile institutions. You try and remove those institutions or limit the power of those institutions to constrain you. And very often the focus is on, on the judiciary. Um, Christopher Rovira Kardwasser, who, who's talking later today, and I wrote um, into the special issue looking at the responses to populists uh, in power. And one of the conclusions we came to was that, that judicial institutions are perhaps the most effective ways of constraining populists. Therefore, it's not really a surprise that you often see populists attacking judiciaries. And here, um, the best example of that would be the current administration of law and justice in Poland, which is attempting to reconstitute the, uh, the constitutional court in Poland. Its argument is it's about trying to get rid of com uh, the, the co communist legacy and so on, but it's also about getting great turnover in, in the constitutional court. And you can see the effectiveness of that because the new constitutional court has issued rulings that challenge the basis of Poland's membership of the European Union, the supremacy of EU law. So already it's the, the, the judiciary is delivering on, if you like, the, the, the populist promise of reform of the judiciary that your own justice have given, which is to try and, uh, and pick battles um, which, which your own justice would like to pick. The third case, and here, this is a more tentative, you can argue that, well, you can certainly see that the, the populism very often attacks um, civil, civil society institutions, and I'm including the media in this, though I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to. Um, Populists will often attack the media that it's opposed to. Um, and with um, I put on the example of Orban and civil society and his, his attack on Soros and his institutions, trying to limit civil society, limiting the power of the media to critique him. Uh, you may want to say that's not really institutional reform, and, and I'm not sure that it's a, a powerful argument, but it's certainly as the more limited form of institutional uh, engineering. So poppers can try and shape the reshape the institutions in ways that suit it, and also in ways that, that effectively carry out the the promise to uh, um, change politics. How far they can do this, of course, is not entirely in their gift. In other words, we need to be aware that populists in different countries and different political systems will have a different capacity to restructure institutions. The third case I come to follows from that. And whereas the other cases I've talked about, I'll give you examples at the end, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk through this um, as, uh, as an example. And I'm gonna talk about Trump. Because it seems to me that, that, that I've been, as we all have, I expect, watching the, the Trump administration uh, watch this rise and fall. Um, uh, it was a fascinating case of what would have been seen like, as a classic case of populism. But actually, I, what strikes me is how little Trump was able to institutionally re-engineer American politics. You may want to argue with me on that, but you're welcome to come back to me afterwards. And I want to suggest that the Trump, um, Bolsonaro, uh, as Daniel talked about yesterday, is also another case that, that maybe fits this category. These are populist politicians that, that come into office and that do not or cannot perhaps reshape institutions, are unwilling to moderate their populism. So how do they sustain their outsider unpolitical um, anti-establishment credentials. Well, they essentially behave as if they were in opposition. And that often means continuing effectively the campaign that got them elected to office. 
But of course, we all know that campaign and governing are different things. But if you look in practice, I think that Trump is a really interesting example of this. Exam cases, ways in which you do this. Well, shoring up the base. We heard this very much in in uh, in reference to Trump. That what he was did was was um, gaining the support of his support, um, maintaining the support of his of his voters, those who had elected him. That Trump's strategy was to go out and to campaign or in office to have these these rallies to try and increase the support from those supporters. He made very little attempt to build new coalitions of support. If you know anything about American politics, you know that to get things through American politics, you've got to build new coalitions. Trump made no attempt to do that. Essentially, he was he played always to the base. Now that's an effective strategy. It can get you into office and it, it did it won in the electoral college but winning the legislative success requires you to reach across politics and that's not what he what he was doing trump polarized and divided in terms of of, of his, his politics he i would argue exacerbated existing conflicts and here's an interesting point again um people talk about polarization again daniel talked about that yesterday in the lecture Populism, it seems to me, both depends upon polarization and exacerbates it. So in the American case, polarization is not a consequence of Trump. Polarization and the literature on polarization certainly precedes Trump. Um, but once in office, the way he operated was to exacerbate that, that polarization. And I think you're seeing the legacy of that under the Biden administration, the difficulty and the, the, of, of trying to push things through, even for Biden in a polarized system, it, it's profoundly problematic. For Trump, that, that was his raison d'etre. He wanted not only to gain the support of, of his supporters, but he wanted to antagonize the opposition. And that's, that's a great strategy, perhaps, if you're trying to get, get into office, but once trying to get legislative success through, it's, it's not such a great strategy. Thirdly, we, you saw with, with Trump that he withdrew from things. In terms of international agreements, the Paris Agreements, you know, the World Health Organization, his instinct, even NATO, he nearly kind of got America to withdraw from NATO by all accounts. Very good at getting out of things, but not about getting it into things. Now, maybe that's a particular Trump like I said, Trump trope, that's, is that, am I allowed to say that? Um, it isn't generalizable, but again, it's not about creating things, it's about withdrawing from international institutions. And that's an easier thing to do, of course, because it, it, may, it means you're hostile and it embodies your hostility. And the last thing I've put under is kind of I call unsettlement. I think politics is about settlements, about getting agreements. Uh, and I think that Trump was about trying to uns and to undermine settlements and to unsettle people. Pierre Ostigi talks about a populism as flaunting the low. He talks about populism as a way of saying the unsayable, of, of using crude, low politics, um, which both antagonizes the, um, the mainstream, but also motivates and mobilizes your base at the same time so for ostiki it's, it's a key part of populism that it always is about unsettling uh, the mainstream the establishment and i we talked about trump and the dead dead cat strategy that i'm sure many of you heard of this that the idea that when things were going badly for trump he always threw a dead cat on the table in other words he would shift the agenda to talk about something else by saying something else controversial something that was polarizing, something that shifted the agenda uh, onto what he wanted to talk about. So, and here I'm trying to be objective, I'm not making a, a political statement. I would suggest that for all the fears about, about Trump, Trump achieved very little. If you remember the inauguration speech that Trump gave when when he came into office, it was about reconstructing American politics. It was about building up infrastructure. He didn't do that. It was about building a wall. He didn't build a wall. Um, it was about fundamental change, but he got very little through. The only real legislative achievement he had was tax reform. And that was largely because that was already the Republican agenda. Legislatively, Trump was a, a, not a successful president. And that's the, that's the dilemma. Um, 
for populism. Maintaining ourselves as an opposition and maintaining a campaign stance, a campaigning orientation to politics may, may you know, sustain your support base, but it doesn't deliver you policy outcomes. Now, you may want to say, well, Trump really wasn't interested in policy outcomes, that's not really his focus. But I, I still think that uh, it's interesting to, the, the assumptions always say that Trump did change things fundamentally. He may have changed the underlying structures of society or increased the polarization, but I'm always struck at how little he actually had to show at the end of, of, his, of his term in office. And if he runs again, it'd be very interesting to see how he will frame that, uh, his, first, his first term in office. And I, um, maybe it's only term in office, but how he frames that. So, and here's the bit where I'm still thinking it through. How can we draw this together? I'm, I'm deliberately drawing a very big picture and I, I recognize, and I'm really interested if there are examples you can think that people don't fit in these cases and whether that's related to their populism. Three points I've made. The first is, if I'm right, if these are the strategies, in effect, only two of them are really popular strategies. In so far as moderating populism as a strategy, it's essentially abandoning populism. So populism, if it wants to sustain itself in office and be a populist regime, has to either institutionally engineer or behave in an oppositional form. That's, that's the, the, the extreme form of, of the hypothesis. It does seem to me that, therefore, what's the choice for politicians? Well, they can choose to lose, lose their populism, but if they choose to keep, keep their populism, then they must either change the institutions or, or become oppositional. What, what decides those strategies? Well, it might be an indiv individual choice. It might be a personality type, Trump perhaps. But I think it's also related to the, the strength of political institutions. It strikes me that Trump, um, for example, you can argue you know, he's trying to he fill the Supreme Court with his, his appointees, but that's what all, all presidents do. That's, that's not new. He, could, he didn't actually try and change the institutions fundamentally. He used the institutions in the ways that other presidents, whether you like them or not, have done in the similar sorts of ways. Um, it may be that, that, in a sense, the Trump experience shows the, the, um, the effectiveness of American political institutions in constraining populism. That's, that, that's one potential conclusion. Second, so what about populist performance? How can, they, how can we um, evaluate them in terms of, of their outcomes? And I recognize, of course, that, um, you know, I focus very much on Trump at the end, but there are other, other cases where you say, well, the populists have been much more effective at changing institutions. But if you focus on an oppositional strategy, it seems to me that you're, you're doing that. You're focusing on maintaining support, but you're not delivering policy outcomes. I can't see an example of a politician maintaining uh, a huge policy success and a policy record that they could run on. Uh, if, they, if they're only oppositional. It's, it's good at, at, at uh, attacking your, your opponents is not necessarily the same as delivering policy. It also seems to me the case that institutional engineering can be at the expense of policy outcomes. In other words, if your attention is on, on constitutional reform, um, then you're not going to deliver policy outcomes. Your focus will be, be on that. Counter examples, and I'm not an expert enough to, to know enough to say about this, but you, know, you could argue Perhaps, but Chavez did both, did both manage to change uh, uh, Venezuelan society fundamentally, but also in constitutionally engineered. So I recognise that's different. Uh, the, there might be contradictions there. What about um, longevity, populist longevity? When I say it creates a challenge for populism, what's striking about populism is there is. Um, We've had populist in power, we've had populist regimes. We don't have a sustained long-term populist family of political par parties, which we would have in other cases, social democratic or Christian democratic or conservative or liberal or whatever. Well, maybe that, that is to come, but at the moment, I think it's quite, quite limited. And maybe that's because these three strategies all work against that. If you moderate your populism, you're essentially admitting that populism hasn't got a long term, that it has to change and it can't sustain itself in office. Um, if you reinstitution, if you re-engineer the institutions, then very often, as was the case of Chavez, uh, 
you show that once that regime changes, those institutions become extremely vulnerable. Uh, because often the institutional change is very centered on, on the, the particular regime at time. So again, that, that mitigates populism as a long-term uh, outcome. And you can, you have already said that the oppositional strategy, in a sense, works against um, a long-term policy success for populism then claim in the future. You can't, there's only a certain length of time that you can maintain yourself in power as an oppositional stra uh, strategy, I would suggest. The one thing I haven't said, and I deliberately haven't said, is that populism kind of moves towards an authoritarianism. Now that, that's very possible, um, but I don't think it's inevitable. I think that institutions can constrain populism, and I think they have largely constrained populism or populist actors in the United States. Uh, I think there have been the, the literature on democratic, democratic backsliding that we see in relation to, say, Hungary and, and Poland may well be true, but it's not necessarily always related to the populism. It may be, I don't think there's anything inevitable about populists becoming authoritarian. And again, that's because I think that populism um, too often is seen um, often in quite narrow terms, um, or limited terms, and is associated with, with the authoritarians that you don't like. But of course, there are the, the possibility of, of, of non-authoritarian non populism is, is still out there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I think now uh, we are open for questions, comments. Yes, please introduce yourself. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this fascinating uh, presentation. My name is Parfin Chakun. Um, uh, my question is, I wonder uh, the relationship between democracy and populism. We know uh, populism is quite related to uh, dissatisfaction with democracy. Uh, however, you gave some examples in some hybrid regimes, uh, for example, Hungary and Turkey as well. So I want to ask, uh, is there any possibility for populist governments in undemocratic regimes without free and fair elections? Uh, so do you see any examples on it? And if uh, there are some examples, what is the aim of populist governments in undemocratic countries? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Professor Taggart, for the interesting presentation. I'm Keith Prushenkin from the Freie Universität Berlin. And um, my question is really to, to question this contention that Trump didn't really change much in office because I think it could be argued that, that Trump effect, <coughs> excuse me, effected a change in the political culture of the United States and really allowed the right, uh, the far right elements in the Republican Party to become more open, to become more unhinged, if you will, and uh, effectively that increases the polarization in the society, that increases the um, or decreases the likelihood that there will be cooperation. So, I mean, I think that even though it wasn't an official uh, institutional change, it really does affect the way those institutions are going to behave, the way the parties participating in those institutions are going to behave as well. Uh, I'd love to hear your comment on that. Thank you. Okay, coffee. coffee uh, it's coffee. Hi, I'm Kofi Arhin from the University of Ottawa. Thanks, Dr. Taggart. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you about what you said about the challenges of populists in power, because I'm actually of the mind that um, populist parties might be more influential when they're actually not in power and exerting influence on the party in power. So I'm wondering what you think of maybe, um, is it better off for a populist party's longevity if they're always on the cusp of winning an election? So enough of a threat that they can exert influence and then the party in power ends up wanting to co-opt their positions and they influence things that way rather than actually winning the election and then having to govern and then taking blame for decision making. Hello, Paul. Uh, in fact, uh, I have uh, two questions. The first one is... Uh, you introduce yourself, Abdul Karim. Abdul Karim. Uh, <laughs> he knows me, assistant professor at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is this idea of, uh, it appears in fact that the most effective way of implementing change by populist government is to make institutional change. This is, it appears this, this the most effective way. But I was wondering why in your opinion in some <coughs> case, cases they are able to do that and other cases uh, they are not able to do that. It's uh, what makes the difference because it's, it appears that is the easy way for them to implement their policies is to make uh, or to implement institutional ch changes. This, my second question is, uh, what do we think in the case when populist parties or populist actors are part of coalitions, to what extent this distinction between the three strategies uh, is also, uh, if I say, maybe true or valid in case of coalition? Mm. Because, you know, mm. uh, uh, Populist parties have been in coalitions before being in power. Uh, Australian cases, uh, uh, Nordic uh, countries, to what extent that m may make a difference? Thank you. Mm. Uh, Paul, mm. if you can answer these questions and then we'll take another round. Thank you. Gosh, that's, a f that's five or well, six really fascinating questions. Um, let's see if I can do, do it in order. I'm not sure if I got your name right. The, uh, was it Fadi, the first, the first question? Um, <laughs> Uh, you asked about um, democracy and, and sort of um, non-democratic regimes and populism. And here, um, uh, I guess I'd say this. Populism is a feature of democracy. Um, it's meaningless for me outside a democratic regime because it's about mobilizing support it's about um doing so in a way that that attacks the establishment without attacking democracy some people see populism as anti-democratic i don't think it's anti-democratic i think it it focuses on one of the signs of democracy democracy for me is about popular sovereignty and but also about uh, rights and the rules of law the rule of law and populism essentially says the rule of law and rights mm. of minority rights have overwhelmed popular sovereignty. So for me, populism is only ever a feature of a democratic regime. I don't think, that, and I think very often what you're identifying in other cases is authoritarianism. Um, and I don't think that that's populism. Populism can veer into authoritarianism in, in democratic regimes. But for me, and I'm, I'm very happy if you want to challenge me on this, but I've, I'm really always come to this idea that I think in the end, populism can only ever exist in democratic regimes. It's meaningless in non-democratic regimes because it's about mobilizing popular sovereignty. <coughs> so I kind of, I'm sorry, if I, I, I challenge the premise of the question. I don't think it's populism you're looking at if it's non-democratic regimes. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm, I, I focus on democratic regimes myself. That's, you know, I don't focus on non-democracies. I, I take the point you talk about hybrid regimes. Uh, uh, I understand that. So as long as you've got elections and competitive elections of some form, then then you have democracy. But th that would be my answer. Keith, that was. Um, I, f I felt myself very scared as I said the words Trump affected no change, uh, and you picked me up on that very well. Uh, you said that. Um, hasn't Trump changed the political culture? Um, has he not increased the polarization such that it, it's now almost impossible for the system to to function? And I, I absolutely, I buy that. I, I agree. I think the American political system is based upon the idea of constructing coalitions um, and polarization is fundamentally problematic for the functioning of American politics. So it may well be that, that Trump has stymied the capacity of presidents to, or regimes or administrations to enact policy um, over, over the next few years. And that is obviously a fundamental change. I, I absolutely agree. I think that the part of that is not Trump. In other words, that he's building on and exacidating a tendency that already pre-existed, the polarization. 
so he's not fully responsible for it. But I do, I do accept the, the thesis that, that Trump may have made American politics kind of impossible. Now that is a change. But this is the paradox, though, for me. But that's not institutional engineering. I mean, you said he changed the political culture. I agree, but I don't think that's institutional change. He hasn't changed the Supreme Court. He hasn't changed. The nature of the constitution he hasn't changed congress it may be functioning in different ways but that's always been the case you know and I, you could argue well he overreached the, the the power of the presidency but again you know think of the imperial presidency thesis of schlesinger going back to the you know the cold war era that's nothing new so it, I, the paradox is is that he has changed politics he hasn't changed the institutions it may be that by changing American society and what you call the political culture of the United States, he may have made those institutions um, problematic in their functioning, but those institutions still remain. That's that's really the, the, the core of what I'm saying. So I agree 100% with what you're saying, but I'd say that's not institutional. I'm struck how little he managed to, how little effect he had on the institutions of US politics. And I, I, you, you might want to come back to me about the Republican Party has fundamentally changed. Well, yeah, I think it, it has. And I, I, I don't disagree with the analysis you gave of it. He, he's allowed certain tendencies to build up within it, um, certainly the radical right and, and the forces that you identified. But again, that's not changing institutions of, of the Republican Party. The American political parties have never been uh, in institutions. They've always been bottom-up um, structures which um, function essentially uh, through, well, we obviously see it now through primaries and so on. They've always been bottom-up institutions. He hasn't, he hasn't changed the structure of the Republican Party because the Republican Party is not really, in a sense, a structure. Um, it's always been a fluid organisation that's a, able to be captured by different wings of the party. That's generally what, what happens. So, yeah, he has made politics. He has, he has changed politics. But I don't think he's changed institutions. Um, and, I, you know, I, I really welcome you to come back and say, yeah, you have shown me where he's changed the institutions. I think there might be cases. But you have to be careful here. I'm sorry, last point on this, which is that the stuff in the institutions, and he, he's fundamentally changed, for example, the, the personnel within the judiciary, not only within the Supreme Court, but within federal courts and other other areas of the judiciary. But that's not that's what that's what presidents always do. He may have done it to a greater ex, ex, uh, extent than others, but that's still uh, still not changing the nature of the institution. Um, Kofi, um, uh, <laughs> that's really, I love that. Uh, isn't it not more effective to be on the cusp? Of, of power and to be out of a more influential and I think it, it blends with the question that came afterwards a little bit um, about being in coalitions um it's uh, it's a good short-term strategy to be able to shout from the, the sidelines but if you really if you really are populist i mean again thinking within the populist mindset if you really want to change politics and you want to get rid of the establishment or to make it function in a different way you can't be outside it. You have you have to actually capture it. Um, but I, it's a short term strategy that may maintain your, your support if you don't quite get into. I love this idea of always being on the cusp. And I, I will blend into, into the question that follows it, the one about being parts of a coalition. Clearly, you see that, that populists, when they become parts of of coalitions, have highly problematic. Um, uh, um, administrations you see that and, and here italy italy is the gift that keeps on giving because you have so many cases of populists you have the the what was the lega nord at the time in coalition with berlusconi two populists in power and you have the five-star movement in in, in coalition with the league uh, i'm not going to go through the details of it. i'm going to say it's never very pretty it's never a nice outcome for them. Um, and they rarely do they do very well in coalitions what always strikes me that the best example was um, uh, we might talk about it um, in Norris paper after in the next session, which is the example of Wilders in the Netherlands, who managed to not be part of a coalition, but to have uh, to be uh, to be necessary for that coalition survival. He said, "I'm not be part of the government, but I will support you." That gave him the ultimate populist dream, which is to be able to have effective. Uh, sway over the government. They had to have the support of, of, of Wilders' Freedom Party, but he didn't get associated with it, its failure. Exactly as you said, he managed to avoid the blame. Um, um, 
And the, the other, last question I haven't dealt with is, um, yeah, what, um, if institutional change is the most effective, you know, why not always, isn't it always easy to do this? Well, the answer is no, it's not easy to, in, to change institutions. To go back to what well, you've probably gathered now, my obsession, which is Trump. Um, Trump would love to have changed institutions. He couldn't change the institutions, is my, is my sense. If he could have enacted a law that said, well, the Supreme Court can now be um, uh, all of it overturned and appointed by me, he would have done that, but he can't. So institutional change may be the most effective option where it's possible for populists, but it doesn't, it's not always possible. And I think it's, it's striking that, that um, Often the Latin American regimes, which have some you know, a more kind of uh, institutional fluidity, where that's possible, you, you very you don't see fundamental change. And I think law and justice in Poland is a case where they're they're not able to fundamentally change the constitutional court. They're trying to, you know, they're, they're at the edges of it. So institutional change is not easy because institutional change requires coalitions. Institutional change requires support. And populists are great at sustaining their own support, but not great at building support uh, and building across uh, across the political system, which is why populism is problematic democratically. I hope uh, I've asked all those six uh, uh, different uh, okay. questions. Uh, I think we have run out of time, but I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to uh, end unless somebody else. Uh, I think uh, I would like to challenge you on a number of points. First... Good. Uh, is it what you are saying that populism uh, is effectively impossible in government? I think that's that's point which you uh, probably are saying that uh, in the sense that uh, if you are a populist, then you go in the government, you have to abandon it, or you have to... Uh, uh, try to do things which are undoable, like changing institutions, and it means that it, it never works. This is uh, this might be challenging uh, because uh, what is the point then of, of populism? Secondly, uh, I think I probably also challenge you in saying that populism and authoritarianism are uh, not compatible. We have examples uh, here in, in our region. Uh, in the late uh, President Gaddafi of Libya, who was a typical kind of populist, and who, when he came to power, he uh, pretend, pretended to be an opposition. Uh, but he was authoritarian at the same time. And he would, for example, uh, uh, ask some of these student committees to storm uh, embassies and even offices of government and take them over. Uh, so, uh, but at the same time, as you know, he was really very, very authoritarian. Uh, so he's playing the opposition and he's playing the government and he's mixing. I think maybe other leaders who are not seen in, in this region who are, have not been seen as populist. Nasser, for example, was a kind of authoritarian populist. I think Saddam Hussein even was also kind of authoritarian populace. Uh, so, uh, but maybe uh, a last, uh, uh, not very important point, I think maybe your title should be chickens in the fox den rather than, because they, they <laughs> the claims of the populists are that they are the ones who are, uh, who are against the foxes who are, uh, anyway, so I, I leave it to you. Is there any <laughs> other last uh, minute question? Okay, you go. You go answer. I, I, I like that last one. I, I, I take your point about inverting the title. That's, that's, that's very good. Um, I, 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 what I'm trying to suggest on the first one, I'm not saying that populism in power is impossible. I'm saying that they have to operate in certain ways. And I'm clearly setting up an ideal type and saying they will tend to move in these directions in office. Well, I thought, I thought Trump was going to resign after two years. I thought he was going to be so fed up of being... Uh, president and not be able to do what he did, he resigned. He didn't. He sustained himself. So it's not impossible. Juan Peron or, you know, Chavez, they, they, they survive. So it's not impossible. They continue. Um, I think in the long term, it's difficult for them to, to create a populist legacy. Argentina being the one case where that's works against me. But generally, 
you don't have a sort of a long populist legacy historically. They tend to come and they flash and, and they go. So no, populism is not impossible in government. And it may mi- clearly it might mix these strategies. I think Modi might be mixing these strategies, for example, and maybe it'll sustain himself for quite a long period of time and get re-elected. So no, I don't think populism is impossible. I think I'm interested in how it operates power. To use a term that's sometimes used, what sort of statecraft does the populism use once it's in office to, to sustain itself? As for you know, populist and authoritarian authoritarians. I mean, if you're not running for election, I mean then you, I don't see how you can be populist. You may claim to use... I mean, I'm sure authoritarian leaders can use populist tropes uh, to um, support themselves, uh, but that doesn't mean they're populists. I don't, if you're not electing somebody, you are, uh, if you're not running for election, I don't see how you can really be pursuing a populist strategy. And, and I don't think the cases you, resolve, you, you gave me are, are electoral forces. So for me, I, I don't... you know. It, to the degree to differ. I don't think these are cases of populism. I think they're better understood as examples or variants of authoritarianism. Um, and populists can be authoritarians as well, uh, but um, authoritarians in non-populist re- and in no- authoritarians in non-democratic regimes to me can't be populist. And that's kind of a starting point because to me, populism is an endemic feature. Um, it's tied to democracy. Uh... I think we have uh, run out of time. Can we? Uh, okay, you you ask question, but quick answer, please. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Taggart. As just a quick question, uh, you talked about Trump achieving very little, and you seem to be very interested in in Trump as a political force, as many are. Uh, but you also were speaking about him as a uh, in the past tense, as it were. And I'm just <laughs> I'm just wondering if. Uh, given some of the developments over the the initial years of the Biden administration, whether you think Trumpism is dead and whether you think uh, there's a possibility that that Trump will run and and potentially succeed uh, in the next presidential election. Yeah. (laughs) No, I don't think he's dead. I think there's a chance he will run. There's a chance he will succeed. I mean, that's absolutely... um, I guess what I, so no, I'm not ruling him out as as a force now. And I, I think again, I, I think it was Keith, wasn't it? I think your you know your, your assumptions about what he's done to the Republican Party are, are crucial for that. It, um, I I just think it's let's let's imagine a scenario where Trump gets into office, um, and I can see that you know what's the narrative here? Well, well Biden is unable to deliver on his agenda, um, and uh, and and Trump comes in as an oppositional force again. Um, yeah, that, that's that's very much a possibility. I can see that as a possibility. Personally, you know, as you say, you, I'm, I'm not interested in Trump. I'm obsessed with Trump, if I'm honest with you. Um, it's been quite traumatic watching Trump over the last uh, uh, the previous four years. I don't want to see it again, but I can see that I can see that possibility. In a sense, being oppositional, being kicked out, and coming, and then he can only get in back again more effectively once he's got something to run against running against biden would be much more effective for for an oppositional populist than running on a second term of what he did in his first term um so you know and and the whole stolen election again that's about creating enemies isn't it that's creating an agenda so no i'm absolutely not ruling ruling trump out uh politically i think he he certainly could come back um i hope personally politically that he doesn't come back um, and I, you know, I have great faith in the American institutions. Perhaps, perhaps too much faith, but if he does, okay, uh, uh, I think that uh, might prove me wrong. Um, I have a couple of questions from uh, our audience on the social media, so I will put them to you. Uh, uh, one question says, "Don't you think that in transitional settings, such as Tunisia?" Populism has turned a nascent democracy into authoritarianism. Uh, and the other question is, uh, what kind of uh, political systems would populism uh, uh, want to uh, establish when they get uh, to power, given that they are anti-power? I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to take the coward's way out on the Tunisia one. I know nothing about the region, and I, I, I don't study transitional regimes, so I, I just don't want to say things I don't know about. Um, 
Um, so that may be true, but I just I can't comment on that. I'm sorry. Uh, on the on the second sorry, can you repeat the second question quickly? Uh, oh, what no, kind of what kind of syst- political oh, yeah. system oppositions uh, populists establish? That's a great. So that's a really great question. Mm. The difficulty with populism is simply this: there is no example of a pure populist. Populism is, is thin-centered. It attaches to other ideologies. There is no example of a pure of a pure populist case. And that's really problematic for us as analysts, because it means they're always something else as well. Hmm. You know, and that's why there's left-wing populism and right-wing populism, why there's, you know, to use uh, Muda and, and Rovira Kalvas' terms, inclusive and exclusive populism. There are different variants of it. So you can't say there is no, there is no populist br- blueprint of what that regime would be. It depends what populism is attached to. In my 2000 book, I use the term as chameleonic. In other words, populism um, takes on the colours of its environment. It reflects the context. So it, it changes. The context that gives rise to populism will shape the way, the way that populism is. So there, is, there cannot be a blueprint of, of a populist regime. Um, but let me. Uh, but that's my, my kind of conceptual get at. But but it's, it's a really interesting question, because it is getting at the point of what does populism want from politics? That's and I, I, you know. So I'd say in the end, it it doesn't really want politics. Populism really wants us to get on with our lives and not to have to deal with politics. And so in the long term, populism thinks it shouldn't be a long term for populism. Populists usually come in saying to say, there's something gone fundamentally wrong. We need to recalibrate, go back to what we used to. Let's make America great again. You know, let's, what about, let's listen to middle America or middle England in my case. Um, it's not about creating something new. It's about, about going back to something that was. So by definition, I think populism can't really talk about, there's no pure case. And I don't think it really constructs a future uh, policy regime in practice. Populists, of course, in different countries will have a vision based upon what they critique of, of what's happened or gone wrong in their case of what they want to happen. But I think it's very hard to talk in abstract, uh, in abstract cases, and that goes to the heart of why populism is so hard to study, because there is never an example of populism. There's always an example of populism with something else, and you can't just. It's like it, um, it's, it's uh, like a something that a, a virus. It has to have a host body to live upon. And if you can't study it in isolation from the host body that it's on. Thank you very much. I think this has been a fascinating uh, uh, talk and discussion, and uh, we hope to see you again soon in person. You will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul, and thanks for the audience. And uh, uh, thanks also to our audience. Shukrali al-mutabi'ina ala wasa'it al-tawasul al-timai. Shukrali.